Minnesota. I'm your host, Tony Hernandez, and welcome to the Great Government Shutdown. Thank you for tuning in to SCC Television Studios and watching on our YouTube channel, Tony Hernandez Show. Every Saturday, we bring you guests from around the world, current events, and the latest of news and entertainment and things that are going on in the economy. We have a great show today. We're going to be bringing on a guest in a little bit, a U.S. congressional candidate. And Sam Pierce is going to be coming in from Syracuse, New York, as usual. We're going to be talking about the government shutdown and a whole lot else. Uh, but before uh, we get too far into it and bring on our first guest, I, I got to tell you about something uh, that I saw the other day. And I have a picture of this, but I was driving to work early one morning and I look over and I see this furry face coming out of the driver or the driver's side of the, the window and I look over and I see this woman driving with her dog, you know, looks all cute and everything. And you know, I have a question. I'm gonna do some more research into this actually to find out is this illegal? Is it legal or illegal to drive with your dog like this? Because you know I think that it actually should be illegal. I think it's a danger to the dog. I think it's a danger to the other drivers out there and I think that she might actually have some of her uh, visual impairment and whatnot there, but uh, I just thought that was uh, pretty interesting and uh, wanted to point that out, and I will do some more research before we get too far into that. But uh, I'm going to bring on our first guest, and it's Mr. Greg Ryan, running for the United States Congress. And Greg, welcome to the Tony Hernandez Show. Uh, thank you very much, and I appreciate the invite here. And I want to personally say congratulations to you for being a new father of a baby boy. It's the most beautiful thing in the world to have that embrace the fatherhood, and uh, it's just really a wonderful thing. I gotta, you know, thank you very much uh, for uh, new fatherhood. Yeah, and, we, uh, well, I appreciate that. And Leona and I, we've had our we've had our hands full with baby Maximilian, but we we love him so much, and it's, it's such a great adjustment and learning period becoming a a father. And you have, you have some kids of your own. I right? have two children; they're two teenagers. So I went through this whole process, and it's just a gift that we receive. Um, the children, my kids are eighteen and fifteen, boy and a girl, um, and it's just really a change. Uh, it, in your whole life and lifestyle. So it's really a wonderful feeling deep inside. And uh, I wish you all the luck and uh, beautiful upbringing with the brand new beautiful child you well, have. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that, Greg. And uh, I guess I should say, too, uh, you know, in terms of you wanted to run for the U.S. Congress, you know this is the seat that I ran for. I'm sure you know that, right? Yes, and uh, it's going to be a tough uh, shoes to fill. I know that because you've got uh, the experience and um, you had the passion and I think you still have it in you and you still can make a decision. I haven't filed yet. So um, you can make these last minute decisions. But <laughs> about me, um, my name is Greg Ryan. I am an owner of Ryan Plumbing and Heating in St. Paul. And uh, the company has been around for over 60 years since 1951. Grandpa started it in 1951, Roy R. Ryan. He was a state legislature uh, back in the 60s. Wow. And then my dad, Minnesota state legislator, yeah, I think 64B, and I'm not sure if they've changed those districts around, but it was so in the Frogtown Paul, area. Okay, Frog Town, yep. yeah. So um, but he was on the DFL side, but I believe DFL was a little different back then in the 60s. Oh, yeah. But well, even back then too, when you know in the 60s during those elections, they didn't have how we do today, where you, where you have a D or an R in front of your name. Back then, I think you were either liberal or conservative or. Or basically right. you had no party that you were voting for. So the times have yeah. changed since the then. The climate is really different. They used to, uh, you know, have these uh, in the back of Lendway's decision making and they had it over at cocktails and uh, cigarettes or cigars. So that's pretty different. Uh, I did get some pictures from my grandpa in the legislature uh, and there were ashtrays in the uh, chambers, which was <laughs> really, really different for me to even see that. So... But my dad died tragically in 1984. Uh, he was uh, robbed, held up, and killed in a tragic accident at the store that we are in right now. Um, and that's the beginning of my career in uh, running the plumbing and heating company in St. Paul. So, well, can you um, get can you go into that uh, that story a little more? Because I, I think that I've heard that in in the past. And you know, can you, when was it? It was February 15th of 1984. Uh, I was working for another manufacturer, another mechanical contractor at the time. Um, I had been, I was a plumber already, and then 
Uh, I was living in Frogtown with my girlfriend on uh, Dale and Thomas, and I had just gotten home from work, and my girlfriend said something bad happened uh, and at the office, so I had to go to the office to see what was going on. I got to my dad's office uh, at 811 University Avenue. Um, it was all cordoned off. I had gotten there a little late because I had worked that full day. Um, I'll never forget the time that there was a, um, Inspector Bovey. He was of the Homicide Department. Mm -hmm. He asked me the weirdest question when I was asked this question. Uh, when I entered the area, probably to qualify me as being, you know, one of my dad's kids, he asked me how many sisters I had, and I said, I don't have any sisters. And he um, said, okay, you better go down to Ramsey Hospital. He's it down to Ramsey. He's just, he goes, don't, you know, don't expect a whole lot or something to that effect. Um, and then, uh, because he went to school with my dad at St. Agnes, um, Detective Bovey. I'll never forget him. Mm -hmm. I think he's been retired since. But my dad would have been in his 80s, born in 32. Oh, so yeah, I know, some, I know some of the Bovey family from St. Paul. Yeah, I'll never forget that. And, uh, you know, the guy was very warm and comforting to me at time of uh, challenge in my life. And we're entering the 30-year anniversary, February 15th, of that tragic uh, incident. But we needed to pick up the pieces and move forward. So that's the beginning of my career in the uh, business. Mm -hmm. So I did have some disadvantages because I was only 24 years old. I had... Um, to learn a lot quickly, I was looked upon as being an inex inexperienced uh, contractor. So um, I had made the decision to refrain from drinking, quit drinking. I had gotten into a little bit of trouble prior to that. Um, I had some DWI, so I decided now is a good opportunity for me to arrest that part of it given the circumstances with my life and my position with the business being an owner. So how long ago was this then? Uh, 30, well I quit drinking in 1984, June of 1984. So I'm entering my 30th anniversary next wow. June. So. And you haven't, had a, you haven't had a single drink no. the entire time? <laughs> No, and a lot of people think when what about I say like I cough drinking, syrup or uh, things uh, like that, like I know you know Vicks. I think I tried that once and it put me to sleep. And I didn't <laughs> like it anymore. So, but that that's about it. But never really any issues. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, a lot of people think that uh, I was a drunk when I say I haven't drinking in such a long time. But you know that really wasn't the situation. It was more motivated by my dad's influence and my position in life mm -hmm. at such a young age. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where I was at. So I've seen a lot of the ups and downs, the economies, ins and outs of uh, you know work in the construction and the plumbing and the heating industry. So, so as a as a business owner, then. How do you, you were a business owner starting at age, young age, 24. 24. You have been for this entire time. Yeah. Uh, how do you go from being a business owner and why would you change what you're doing now to become involved in federal politics? Well, it was kind of a little transition period. During our 08, uh, I've always been a little bit interested politically. So I've always, you know, read uh, the political sections of the newspaper. I've always kept up to date on a lot of the uh, current events that took place in Washington and a lot of state politics that have taken place that directly affected the business and the business climate. That's my uh, passion is small businesses and the climate which they conduct um, day-to-day operations with our customers and the uh, the ability for our customers to afford upgrades or afford uh, conversions from less efficient to higher efficient. So I've always been uh, aware of the the economic climate that relates to business climate with the customers and the business relationships. So I just felt as if there was a lot of uh, things happening in our government through the last 30 years which I've experienced. Our uh, government has taken over a lot of the aspects of um, the day-to-day -day lives of people as far as the uh, removing a lot of the financial uh, capabilities of my customers and people at large uh, because the elevated costs of everyday living 
Um, I go to my customers, I try to upgrade on a little bit of efficiency, and I say in the long run, it's going to, you know, better off you as far as your payments every month, it's going to lower your payments. Um, they just look at me and they say, I just can't afford it. I just can't do it. My taxes are this high. I've got this obligation. My health insurance is this. So there's a lot of uh, underlying circumstances that affect small businesses and the ability for customers to buy carpet, mm -hmm. the drapes, a new dishwasher. Um, it's just a lot of the basic needs for families that would like to buy their children uh, you know, a new set of sneakers, um, maybe some school supplies or sport equipment you know, for their activities. So there's always something going on in everybody's life that they need that little extra money to uh, enhance their uh, stand on life. Mm -hmm. And our government has been intruding in on that a little bit. And I've been paying attention to that with my customers on a small business scale for a long time. And that's when I kind of started getting more interested in, uh, you really can't go out and talk to the, the rank and file people because you can't affect change by talking to the rank and file person. You actually have to go up a little farther um, in the ladder of authority, politics or somebody that's more in charge to making change um, with policy. So. I just thought that uh, it would be a good time for me to get a little bit more active in the uh, political arena. Nice. So. Well, I want to ask you a couple more questions. I know your time is valuable right now. Um, the, the first question that I want to ask is, is when Sam Wayne Pierce comes on, he's a contributor to our show, we're going to be talking about the government shutdown, made tons of news. And uh, uh, first of all, what's wrong with Washington, D.C.? Well, I think there's just too many lobbyists, too many influential people that are in Washington and stuck in Washington that are making uh, big influential markings on the people that make policy, like the politicians. Uh, it's just hard to say exactly what's going on. I've never been there, but um, I just think they're not listening closely to their constituents and the mm -hmm. voters at large. And then the other question I have is, you know, with the U.S. House, many of these districts are gerrymandered. They're either majority Democrats or majority Republicans. The 4th Congressional District obviously being uh, made up of more Democrats, yellow dog Democrats, blue dog Democrats in St. Paul. What is your strategy to uh, win over some of these, these key votes right there? Well, I think what we need to do is approach each individual voters that have been voting continuously for the over 60 years for the Democratic mm -hmm. Party and just to let them know that we will embrace all the voters, all the consumers, all the people that are earning money out there that uh, have been penalized for doing better or advancing their cause for their family. Mm -hmm. um, every time somebody says, hey, I just got a raise, well, the government just got a raise at that same time. Mm -hmm. That hurts me to know that our, um, our citizenry is providing funding for an in inefficient government. And I wanted to bring this graph up, uh, Dallas, if you could put it up. This shows the U.S. House re-election rates from 1964 to 2012. You can see in 64 it was maybe around 85, 90 percent, and there's been times 86, 88, 90, where it was almost 100 percent re-election rates. And in the 90s, and 80, the early parts of 2000, same thing. Uh, you know, when I see these numbers, it, it, it shows just what a daunting task it is to win a seat from an incumbent. And uh, I just wanted to get your reaction on, you know, why do we have these types of re-election rates and, and do you support term limits? I, I do support term limits. Um, actually, you know, let me qualify that. The a term limit, you, for someone who gets elected for a two-year period, it's really hard for me to imagine to... Uh, have that individual effect change in a one two year uh, term. Um, I think that what we should have is a six year or a three term limit on the House and possibility of a two year term limit on the Senate. The challenge is, is you want the effective people to stay in and the ineffective people to 
get turned over. But that is all up to the voters, and I can see the other side where people would understand that there are term limits, and that is incumbent upon the voters. So I want to, everyone, uh, first of all, when you want to come back in the future, you're more than welcome to come on the show anytime. Uh, can you let everybody know how they can find out more about your campaign, uh, your website, and things like that? The website is not launched. I'm not an official candidate right now. I still have to file with the FEC, but we do have a URL, and it's ryanforus.com. It's Ryan, F-O-R, or Ryan for, the numerical for, us, U.S. dot com. And that's uh, right now the way you can get in touch with me and uh, help me campaign and help me beat that incumbent. Sounds good. Well, Greg Ryan, thank you for coming on the show. I I'm really appreciate it. Here and, uh, I'll give Leona my best. And you know, yes. thank you for those nice words about Maximilian as well. I appreciate that. I love that name. I really do. I think that's really a cool name. <laughs> well, thank you. Good luck with that family, and uh, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. And that's uh, Greg Ryan, candidate for the United States Congress, and uh, he was joining us today at our studios, and we're thankful to have him here. I believe he said his website is gregryan4us.com. That's gregryan4us.com. Check him out. We need more people stepping up and, and running you know, in this Democrat uh, town that we have and, and people stepping up to the power, to the establishment. And uh, we thank and salute anyone who uh, steps up and runs for office, no matter what the political ideology is or whatnot. And at this point, we're going to uh, tune in from Charlie Kosnick. He is uh, broadcasting from Los Angeles, California, and he comes in every week uh, with his report. And we're going to line that up right now and uh, get it played. Here we go again. Hey everyone, welcome to the Cause Report. I'm your host, Charlie Kozak. We come to you from an underground bunker because it has happened. The government has shut down. This is a catastrophe. This is unprecedented. This is something that we cannot survive. It's actually happened 17 times since 1976. What? Seriously? We've survived this 17 times since 1976? Ah! Damn you, MSNBC and your scare tactics. Well, since we've been through this before and everybody survived, what actually happens during this government shutdown? You better start thinking differently because, you know, like if you need a passport, can't get it done. Planning a visit to a national park or monument, too bad, can't get there. What? No parks? How dare the Republicans take away a teenager's right to go to Joshua Tree and take shrooms? Those monsters. Look, while I completely support the repeal of Obamacare, I just, uh, I don't know if this was the best tactic. Because yes, I know the Republicans compromised from defunding to a one-year delay. And yes, I know it was the Democrats who didn't sign the House's bill to keep the government open. But as Republicans, we have to know how to play the game. We have to know the media will never tell the story that way. We need to start playing the game and scoring PR points along the way. So, instead of pushing to defund Obamacare because numerically, with the votes in the Senate and the President, it's never going to happen. And yes, with the 42 previous resolutions, everyone knows we are against this monstrosity. So the House should have made a bill that said, you know what, we'll keep the government open. As long as you, Mr. President, and your family join the Obama exchanges. You have to give up your concierge doctor, Mr. President. You know what? Put him on the spot. So he has to stand in front of America and say this. Uh, I can tell you that the American people would have difficulty understanding why we would weaken our economy, shut down our government. Because I don't want to see the Obama family. Participation in the exchanges. Nah. Now he looks like the elite out of touch person that he actually is. Okay, yes, granted, he would never say those exact words, but it's something that would paint him in the light that he needs to be painted in, as a political elite. And yes, it's a far out there hypothetical that would not have been feasible for the Congress to do, but it's that kind of outside the box thinking that we need in order to start being a player in the game rather than some media pawn. Look, I respect Ted Cruz, Mike Lee, and Marco Rubio for making a stand for something they believe in. That doesn't make them 
wacko birds or extremists that makes them admirable. Even if I don't fully believe it's the best long-term strategy, at least they're walking the walk. For all those Democrats out there that you thought you were so hip and cool when you took the food stamp challenge where you lived on food stamps for a week, I now dare you to walk the walk and take the Obamacare challenge. For one year, live like the hard-working people of America that have private insurance. Live on a middle-class salary and pay the premiums that will now double or triple because of Obamacare. Just try living in a predicament you created. Look, we all know liberals will not take this challenge. We all know that hashtag Obamacare challenge will not trend on Twitter. And that says everything you need to know. And that makes them the real extremists. But hey, that's just me. Make sure you go out and check us out at thecausereport.com and click that button right there to subscribe to my channel. That's it for today. We'll see you next time on The Cause Report. So that's the Cause Report coming out of Los Angeles, California, and Charlie Kosnick uh, bringing it as usual. And we're going to uh, now bring in our East Coast correspondent, Sam Wayne Pierce, who's joining us from Syracuse, New York. Sam Wayne Pierce. Hello, New York. Hello, International Falls. <laughs> How's everything going, Sam? Give us things some good great. news. Uh, so many things are, things are great, as usual, despite the uh, government shutdown. I try to find the best every day. Are you guys uh, Are you guys surviving out in New York in the post shutdown world? Have you noticed m many differences? Uh, well, Tony. I, I have, and I think we're going to get into some of that later on. I have some good examples, so uh, so I'll save that for when, when we get to it. But I think more and more Americans everywhere are actually starting to, to see the impact of the shutdown. Yeah, there's no doubt. It's starting to uh, hit close to home, and like you said, we'll be, uh, we'll be talking about some of those areas uh, later. And, and I've had some direct experience, actually, in the uh, mortgage industry with this. So it's some scary stuff, but... Uh, so, Sam, uh, it, despite the government shutdown, October 1st came and went, which means the Obamacare exchanges are up and running. What do you think, Sam? Do you think that the October 1st launch was a success or was it a failure? Well, Tony, if we're going to grade the first week of the exchanges, the easy answer, obviously, would be to say incomplete because we can't possibly judge them four days in. Um, but that's weak television, so I'm going to give you my updated Obamacare Exchange launch report card that I happen to have. There we right go. Here. I, brought, I brought a visual aid. I don't even know if you'll be able to see it across our, it, our Skype interview. But It, it looks uh, like a, a C-. Is that what it is? It's a C-. It's a C-, minus, Tony. That's right. This was pretty fancy, handwritten. But uh, So launching the exchanges, uh, I think it was rough, but not totally disastrous. There were a lot of glitches and the government sites were not equipped to handle all of the traffic, that's for sure. But like I said, I'm going to give the launch a C-. minus. The president's willing to admit that there are software glitches to be overcome, but some of that is stemming from the fact that there was so much traffic to these sites, Tony, so there's maybe more interest in signing up than what the Republicans want us to believe when they talk about how many Americans are opposed to Obamacare. So... Uh, so I, I found that really interesting. Uh, also, another important point, enrollment started on October 1st, Tony, but it's not, it, it's enrollment for the January 1st, the, the calendar year 2014. So we've got these, they've got these glitches to work out, but it buys the government some time for us to find out how, how bad or, or maybe how good the technology behind the exchanges is. So, uh, so, the, so like I said, C minus. Um, but regardless of how we grade the Obamacare exchanges a week in, uh, the fact remains that they're up and running, whether people like Senator Ted Cruz like it or not. And Tony, last week we talked about Senator Cruz and his 21-hour pseudo filibuster. Um, but the exchanges went live. Obamacare is getting all of its non-discretionary funding. So what did Senator Cruz and the rest of the far right accomplish after all? Well, I think what he accomplished was bringing to light 
his opposition and also showing the strength in numbers that opposition to Obamacare really has. And he put it all out there, and I believe he's awakening the giant or the giant is being awoken right now. And we're going to see the net results of that play out in the 2014 election, similar to how we saw it play out in 2010. Don't forget the 2010 U.S. House was won by conservatives strictly on the issue of opposition to Obamacare. And as Obamacare is being implemented and as more and more people are buying into the exchanges and being forced into the exchanges, they are realizing how gosh darn expensive it is. And I'll give you a good example is uh, the uh, poster boy of the, the movement at one point. Uh, he went on, and let's see if I can find this right now, and uh, Dallas, if you can pull this up, uh, we're going to play this now. Comes down to Obamacare. Republicans want it defunded. Democrats are standing their ground. But how is the controversial Affordable Care Act impacting uninsured people in our area? One local man shares his story with Channel 3 Eyewitness News reporter Kimberly Barber. Hey Greg, Cindy, with Obamacare in effect, every American citizen is required to have health insurance in 2014 or be subject to fines. Today I talked to a local man who says the government mandated insurance is helping his family in a big way and wants people to try to look past the political back and forth that's at the center of the shutdown. It being such a political issue, you know, you got Republicans on one side and Democrats on the other and most of the time news, news stories or news coverage is is based on the fight between those two groups and uh, individual and real life stories aren't really brought out. 21 year old Chad Henderson was raised by a single dad who dropped insurance on him years ago because premiums raised higher than he could afford. Normally if I have a cold or if I'm really sick, uh, you know, it's, it's not going to at all. His dad Bill has never been covered. I cannot remember a time where he's ever went to the doctor because he just couldn't afford it. Um, so it'll be a lot easier knowing that we have health care. So they were on healthcare.gov as soon as the insurance marketplace opened early Tuesday morning. They both picked a plan and enrolled. Uh, it was a little more than I thought it was going to be, but um, it's in my budget, so I, you know, I'll be able to afford it. But he says the biggest difference the Affordable Care Act is having on his family is by changing standards for people who already had insurance, like his baby cousin Anna, who was born with half a heart. She's had hundreds of thousands of dollars in surgeries, hitting her insurance company's lifetime cap for care for one person. Now that's no longer an issue. Once this health care law passed, it lifted that cap, uh, essentially saving her life. Henderson hopes his story encourages others in our area to put their political beliefs aside to at least look into whether the new law can help them. Henderson. Okay, so that's, uh, I brought up that example there because uh, that gentleman, you know, he was a big supporter of the law beforehand. He's somebody who's a prime example. He's young, uh, relatively healthy. He did not have health insurance or access to health insurance prior to the law. Uh, the first day he went out there and he signed up and, you know, went through the process and he, he now has health insurance and uh, it's interesting because, you know, he noted and kind of uh, downplayed it a bit, but he, he said it was a little more expensive than what he thought and uh, some people went in and actually did some research. Uh, he makes about uh, just under $12,000 a year and so he went on to the exchange to sign up for this health care and he found his parameters and whatnot and discovered that his new monthly premium was going to be $175 a month on less than $12,000 a year. Uh, so that turns out to be around 18% of his gross income that he's now going to be paying into the exchanges. And, you know, it's, he's going to have health care, but some people are using this as an example about how Obamacare isn't necessarily what it's promised to be because eHealthInsurance.com came out and said that if this gentleman would have went to e-insurance uh, and, and signed up for his premium, it would have been $42 a month in, in the private market prior to Obamacare. And so here's, Sam, what I believe is going to be happening more and more is, is everyone's excited about the idea of universal coverage. Everybody's excited about the idea of helping people who need health care, who didn't have access to coverage. Like People are passionate and compassionate about that, there's no doubt. But I think what's going to happen is when the individual mandate kicks in and everybody is going to be forced into, and let me stress that, forced into buying into this exchange, 
they're going to find out that all of a sudden they're going to be paying a couple hundred dollars a month for health care that they may or may not need and, and have coverage and access to things that they might not need like birth control or maternity care or newborn infant care. If you're a single man, why would you want to uh, basically pay for some of these services that you're, you're not going to use? And because this is being enforced by the IRS and because of the individual mandate, uh, which is federal law that forces individuals to uh, sign up uh, within the exchanges if they're uncovered, uh, it's going to rear its, its ugly face. And I think people are going to, uh, they're going to wake up to it. And, it. and it might be independent of what Senator Cruz did in, in the filibuster and Senator Rand Paul and Marco Ruby, all these guys standing up against it. But they are going out on the record and they're saying that conservatives are against uh, the federal health care system because it's going to cost more than what they say it's going to do. And, uh, you know, when people are actually having to pay their deductibles, they're going to realize it's even more expensive than what they anticipated. So uh, that being said, Sam, the, the government is still shut down no matter what. And as you pointed out, the Affordable Care Act is uh, going into law. The exchanges are in place. People are signing up for it. And uh, there's a lot of political posturing on, on both sides. But the real question is, Sam, is how is the shutdown uh, affecting America and Americans? Sure, Tony. I, I'd like to get into some examples. I actually finished some Tony Hernandez show research just this morning. I spoke to a friend who uh, is employed with the federal government. Mm -hmm. uh, here where I live in Syracuse, New York, we, we have a federal building downtown. And I have a friend who works for SSA, the, the Social Security Administration. And he explained to me that uh, he's been going to work every day since the shutdown, but he explained that if nothing changes, uh, the way that, that the employees there have been informed is that when they get paid, which is biweekly, like a lot of people, but they're going to get paid this week, and it's going to be prorated, Tony. They're going to get six days of pay, essentially, instead of ten, because there were the four days of the shutdown this week, and that's the way it fell in the pay period. So they'll get six rather than four. If this were to lag on for a few more weeks and get to another pay period, they could potentially get nothing despite going to work every day. Now, we've seen that, that the House uh, and Republicans all along have been trying to pass some piecemeal legislation to address these things, and I believe they had a vote to, to, to say let's pay federal employees regardless of, of essential or non-essential if they're going to work. But uh, that hasn't passed the Senate. The president hasn't signed it. We don't know. That's really up in the air because sometimes it becomes political, almost like one side wants to inflict pain to blame the other side. So uh, federal employees, that's an example of people that have families and bills to pay, and they, they might feel the crunch for a little while yet if they go without pay. There's, yeah, there's no doubt about that. And, uh, you know, I have a, uh, some family who are federal employees, and uh, it's the same thing the paycheck, the uncertainty, uh, whether or not, and it has a ripple effect too, is whether or not these employees, because let's face it, most uh, federal employees are just like any other working American families out there where you skip a couple paychecks and your savings or immediate savings depletes and it's now a question of do I pay my mortgage and not pay my cell phone bill and cut back on groceries or uh, do I have to, you know, play this game and, and pay my cell phone bill late to pay this one? And uh, th these are very real decisions that uh, people are going to uh, be facing. And I know firsthand that some of the federal agencies, at least uh, in the inside, are telling their employees that this government shutdown is only going to last another week. And, and I don't know if that's true or not, because it certainly appears that uh, President Obama and the Senate Democrats are unwilling to negotiate or to uh, basically buy into this idea of piecemealing yeah. uh, different parts of the government so that uh, parts stay open and, and stay operating. And, um, you know, with the mortgage business, too, I was telling you when we were talking on the phone yesterday that every time a person applies for a mortgage, whether it's for a purchase or a refinance, uh, they sign a form called the IRS 4506T which is something that they sign and, and we take with our processing and send it to the IRS. And the IRS sends back their tran tax transcripts, which we compare to their W-2s and the tax returns that we have on file. And this particular portion of the IRS is actually shut down right now. 
and we've got notice that they're still going to uh, the investors are still going to fund the loans without having these transcripts on file but they're going to do post funding audits to make sure you know that the tax returns match up and and that everything matches up with the irs records uh, but if the shutdown goes on too long um, you know we're talking months i could see these investors getting weary and not funding new mortgages because of that 4506 because of the increased liability uh, that they have from a credit perspective so that's something that would affect me and my business directly and not only that it would affect the real estate market which by a lot of economists viewpoint the real estate recovery and the homes appreciating and, and the activity taking place is one of the main fuels to our economic recovery so if we throw a wrench into into that aspect that could have some pretty devastating effects to the overall economic recovery and put us right back to where we were in 2007 and 2008. So some pretty real things that are going on with this sure. shutdown. There's no doubt. Sure. Tony, uh, and it's, that is a, a great example and it hits close to home for you. Um, there are some others. Uh, Wall Street Journal this week reported that Lockheed Martin, large federal defense contractor, on Monday will furlough 3,000 employees. Wow. Uh, they have about 110,000 U.S.-based employees. They're going to furlough 3,000 on Monday due to the shutdown. So almost three percent, about 2.7 percent of their workforce in the U.S. will be sent home. Um, Boeing, uh, Sikorsky, who, who makes the military, military helicopters, there are others that have said they will probably follow suit. So uh, defense contractors, that certainly, uh, if, if not this week, uh, in the coming weeks, will furlough or lay off employees and uh you know your example hits close to home for you i, I think there are there are several uh that we're going to read about in, in the next week or two um and then also tony there are those issues that uh when it comes to federal government services mm -hmm. that start to impact us and anything that's considered non-essential that are cut off to all of us. And one of the bigger examples in the news this week was the closing of all of the national parks. Mm -hmm. it includes things like uh, memorials in Washington, D.C. And one of the big ones this week, I think we're going to hopefully have some video footage on it, was the closing of the World War II memorial and some of the controversy that has ensued regarding that. Yeah, so, we're going to, uh, we're going to try to pull up some of that video uh, right now here, Sam, if I can... Uh I can find it but yeah did you so were you talking about specifically the veterans memorial is that what you were uh, discussing that's right tony so uh so world war ii vets come to washington dc to see the world war ii memorial on the national mall and these trips are planned well in advance and and oftentimes it's you know the surviving vets from a certain state or a certain part of the country that make the trip to washington mm -hmm. so early in the week um there were a number, I think, from Mississippi uh, and, and maybe a couple other states that showed up, and it was the day that the government had shut down, and the National Park Service had been forced to put up the, the sign that due to the government shut down, the, the memorial was closed. Um, several lawmakers, I think primarily Republican congressmen and women, actually came down to the memorial and... Uh, as our friend Jake would say, I actually thought this was a pretty ballsy move. They came down to the memorial and helped to remove the barricades to let these um, you know, pretty elderly vets at this point in to, to see uh, the World War II memorial. Uh, the Park Service, and I thought uh, a wonderful move, seeing that they're considered non-essential, came up with this compromise, and they said, Let's keep this open to these vets, these visiting groups of vets. Yeah. It's got closed to the general public, but let's keep it open to the vets. And we're showing some uh, footage right now, Dallas, if you could pop that up. There you go. Yeah, here's footage of the vets. Keep talking, Sam. Well, Tony, it got really interesting uh, late in the week. So just yesterday, actually. Um, th so, we, so the Park Service comes up with this really nonpartisan compromise to let, let, let's let these vets in here. So the Thursday overnight, all of a sudden, the barricades to the World War II Memorial are back up. 
and they're reinforced. And it's really, really difficult to get in. Well, it happens to be a group of vets that was coming in from Texas that day to see the memorial. So a couple of Texas congressmen, <laughs> I think very courageously, Tony, heard about this, and they came down, one of these gentlemen, uh, with a pair of bolt cutters to get into the memorial uh, so that so that their constituents could that were World War II vets could could see the memorial as they had planned. Um, this is probably an example of pretty dirty politics. Someone went to the Park Service and said, "Nope, we need to make it as hard as possible uh, for people to get in, even if they are the World War II vets, so that we can blame, I assume, Republicans." Uh, that, that this is their fault, the shutdown's their fault, and let's let's make it painful for people. But these Republican uh, congressmen, Louis Gomer, who's in the news a lot, and then also Representative Ralph Hall, a 90-year-old representative from Texas who flew for the Navy in World War II, went down with bolt cutters and said, uh, nope, we're going to open this back up. And I thought that was a really wonderful story this week. Yeah, that was uh, that's pretty. It's pretty incredible to see that footage of the vets at these memorials, and it, it really puts things into perspective. And you know, throw the politics aside. You know, didn't we pay for Mount Rushmore a long, long time ago? And you know, this idea that we need to have the government funded so that these national treasures that we have remain open it is a pretty bitter point of controversy and conflict. I, I believe, especially when you're dealing with memorials that are in the open air, that are on federal soil, um, and to block that from the taxpayers, from Americans, from citizens, it's, uh, it's eye-opening, and, and it really shows the bitterness that is being um, communicated on, on both sides. And Sam, we're going to actually highlight some of this bitterness that we've been seeing on the field. And uh, first one comes from MNCD4 Conservative, uh, he actually found this video here, and we're going to uh, line that up. You all talked about children with cancer unable to go to clinical trials. The House is presumably going to pass a bill that funds at least the NIH. <clears throat> Given what you said, will you at least pass that? And if not, aren't you playing the same political games that Republicans are? Listen, Senator Durbin explained that very well. And he did it here, he did it on the floor earlier, as did Senator Schumer. And it's this. What right do they have to pick and choose what part of government is going to be funded? It's obvious what's going on here. <clears throat> you talk about reckless and irresponsible. Wow. <clears throat> what this is all about is Obamacare. They are obsessed. I, I don't know what other word I can use. I don't know what other word I can use. They are obsessed with this Obamacare thing. It's, work, it's working now, and it'll continue to work, and people will love it even more than they do now by far. So. They have no right to pick and choose. Um, but if you can help one child who has cancer, why wouldn't you do it? Listen. Is that head start, Mom? We were doing uh, why pick what, one what, against what, the other? What, why, why would we want to do that? I, yeah. ha I have 1,100 people at Nellis Air Force Base that are sitting home. They have, they have a few problems of their own. This is to have someone of your intelligence suggest such a thing. Maybe I'm means you're ir irresponsible. I'm just <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Now, Wolf, uh, he's wow, so that's, uh, that's one example right there, Sam, of, um, of some of the, the anger and, and bitterness. And I'm getting the sense that this is, that Harry Reid's not faking this outrage no. as he normally does. You can really sense that he's frustrated. And, you know, when she was asked him the question about why wouldn't you help a, a little child with cancer, and, and he just couldn't get his head around that question. Yeah, because they, they want their cake and they want to eat it too, Tony. And um, I, I'm, I'm not going to say that there aren't factions of the Republican Party that have approached this in the same way. Um, I, I think you can find a lot of stubbornness to go around and a lot of blame to go around. But we have both sides that want all or nothing. They want everything that they want or nothing at all. And... Mm -hmm. The Republicans, to their credit, I, I think in the, they, they tried to introduce some piecemeal legislation this week, Tony, 
And I actually think, all politics aside, I, I started thinking about it. I think we need to, to move <laughs> to that system. I started thinking about either my personal budget, you know, like you, I, I keep a spreadsheet on the computer with my bills and what I have to pay and what's essential and what's not and should I eliminate cable? Do I need uh, the, the ultra internet package, that sort of thing? And I attack, the, I break it down and I attack things one at a time and, and it works. We're, we're in budgeting now where I work for the upcoming fiscal year and I get asked to submit my budget for my department and I do so and I, it's new software, it's new projects, it's labor, it's all sorts of things and management takes a look at it and it comes back and I get some of it and some of it's slashed. Um, why can't our government do that? Why can't they pass budget legislation a piece at a time, which would allow us, the constituents who vote them into office, to say, oh, that's interesting. Um, you know, Representative McCollum, for example, voted for, for this, but not that, rather than this big, giant, albatross monstrosity. Um, so I think all politics aside, piecemeal legislation is something that representatives and senators should start supporting more frequently. Yeah, there's no doubt. There's no doubt about that. And there's been some movements towards single subject legislation, and and the main objection you hear to that is, oh, we would never be able to get anything done. It's all part of the compromise process, and and da 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 da. But you know, I think that uh, I think that that's pretty uh, decent advice, Wayne. And we're going to show another clip here of some of the uh, outrage in Washington D.C. This time, it's from uh, the uh, House Leader, Representative. Boehner, and uh, we're going to get him on right House, now. Uh, the other night, and uh, listen to the president some 20 times explain to me why he wasn't going to negotiate. Uh, sat there and listened to uh, the majority leader in the United States Senate describe to me that he's not going to talk until we surrender. And then uh, this morning, we get the Wall Street Journal out, and it says, "Well, we don't care how long this lasts uh, because we're winning." This isn't some damn game. The American people don't want their government shut down, and neither do I. All we're asking for is to sit down and have a discussion and to bring fairness, reopen the government, and bring fairness to the American people under Obamacare. It's as simple as that. But it all has to begin with a simple discussion. Uh, our goal here wasn't to shut down the government. So that's uh, the House leader right there, and uh, the last one that we're going to play is a live feed from President Obama, and this was from uh, er, last week, and we'll play that right now. At midnight last night, can everybody hear me? Mike working? Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, at midnight last night, for the first time in 17 years, the Republicans in Congress chose to shut down the federal government. Uh, let me be more specific. One faction of one party in one House of Congress in one branch of government shut down major parts of the government, all because they didn't like one law. This Republican shutdown did not have to happen, but I want every American to understand why it did happen. Republicans in the House of Representatives refused to fund the government unless we defunded or dismantled the Affordable Care Act. They've shut down the government over an ideological crusade to deny affordable health insurance to millions of Americans. So we'll give uh, President Obama the last word there as we uh, continue. Um, we're going to change topics a little bit here, Sam, and I know you're living in New York City, or New York State, I'm sorry, and you probably don't hear as much of this story as we're hearing right now, but the Archdiocese of the, the Twin Cities, the Catholic Church, is uh, under pretty intense scrutiny right now. There is an emerging uh, quote-unquote scandal uh, involving a priest who is now in jail, Father Kurt. And uh, basically, yeah, this story is just starting to come to light. And there's a lot of people being thrown into the mix here. Uh, last week, uh, Father uh, Reverend Peter Laird resigned, uh, quit from his position as a VCAR general, and uh, his resignation came shortly, shortly after allegations emerged in St. Paul Court that co church officials knew a priest had been in possession of child pornography, but continued to assign him to parish duties that brought him into contact with children. 
The allegations were contained in the St. Paul Police Report made public uh, on Thursday in Ramsey County District Court. Uh, so basically, um, there was a, a priest who was allegedly known by, other, by the Catholic Church of St. Paul that was in possession of child pornography and uh, another person that uh, has been kind of, um, in a way, uh, involved in this scandal. If Dallas, you want to pull up the uh, picture right now. This is uh, Father Kevin McDonough. He is uh, the pastor at St. Peter Claver Church in uh, St. Paul. And he was the, the vicar uh, general during the time when this other priest was allegedly uh, having his indiscretions and he was finding out about it and there was some information that he found out that could have potentially pointed out that this priest was a danger to other children. And, and what I find a little bit alarming about this, and, and in full discretion, I'm a practicing Catholic, married in the Catholic Church. Uh, our son, Maximilian, is going to be baptized in the Catholic Church. Uh, I want to draw a distinction between A, you know, what the priest is, and the priest is a human being, is a person, and B, from the scandal. So priests are going to make mistakes. Priests are going to be imperfect. That does not mean that uh, the infallible teachings of the church are, are imperfect. It just simply separates man and sin from that which is divine and holy in, in God. That being said, I, I am a little bit alarmed at what appears to be, and many are alleging, is a cover-up by uh, people in the Catholic Church of, of this particular priest, Father Kurt, who many knew uh, at least had some perversions and was engaged in various activities, uh, but the possession of child pornography is strictly illegal, and the second that people found that out, uh, they should have brought it to light. But, you know, we're going to uh, continue to, to report on this story, and it's being reported primarily through NPR News and also um, the Star Tribune, and of course, you know, anything that embarrasses the Catholic Church, the Star Tribune uh, will love to, to jump on top of. Uh, but that's the uh, priest's name, is, is Father Curtis uh, Waymeyer, and you know, he used to, you know, that's a picture of him right there. Uh, but I would encourage you to, to look more into this and, uh, you know, find out exactly what's happening here because there's going to be a lot of spin and whatnot. But what I did find uh, interesting as well is that uh, Father McDonough, you know, has some ties actually, and, and these are not related per se, but uh, his brother, Dennis McDonough, is the chief of staff for the President Obama administration. And uh, when he was first uh, appointed to be chief of staff, this was back in... January, February, when we were just starting the show, you know, I brought to light and congratulated him. He's from Minnesota. He, uh, Dallas, if you want to put the picture up there. He's a Minnesota native. He played football at uh, St. John's University, All-American, part of a big Catholic family, grew up in Stillwater, and now is the chief of staff of the Obama administration. But, you know, one thing I did want to talk about, and we're kind of running out of time here, Sam, and maybe we can talk about this next week, but I wanted to introduce him because Dennis McDonough uh, is well known in Washington, D.C. He's Washington to the bone and uh, basically was the chief of staff, I believe, of Senator Tom Daschle. And, and McDonough was instrumental in promoting the ideology of preeminent strike, of going in and striking Iraq uh, without you know, an immediate threat. They used the weapons of mass destruction and the, the threat of future terrorism as justification to take them out. And then, of course, with Syria, which we're not hearing much about at all, uh, McDonough being one of the main people pushing to go into Syria, making the argument as to why we needed to attack Syria. And, and now in this post-government shutdown world, we don't hear anything about it anymore. But I just wanted to play this clip uh, quickly, and maybe that'll set us up for next week. So, uh, Dallas, if we can do that as long My as... My customers... Uh, if you can turn that down for a sec, we'll, we'll get the commercial going. But, um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's what we're going to be uh, talking about. He went on the, the Sunday morning news circuit a couple weeks ago and really was selling this idea of the Syrian war. So when we have that pulled up, we'll get that going uh, right now. So Dallas, can you pull that up? And, and Tony? Yeah. You just don't uh, recognize 
United him based on just his, his local ties to the community there, they will certainly recognize him. He, he was also sitting right next to the president in, uh, I think it's the, the Situation Room, maybe they call him the White House, when the Osama bin Laden raid was taking place. He, he's a he's not just the chief of staff, he is a very, very close yeah. friend and political ally to President Obama. That's a good that's a good point here, Sam, and we'll, we'll get that picture up right now. That's... Uh this is a very famous picture that emerged when Osama bin Laden was killed. You know, everyone looking serious. But there's Dennis McDonough right there. I got the arrow on his face. He's right to the, you know, in the center between uh, Hillary Clinton and, and President Obama, the chief of staff, and uh, all these other people. This is at the moments when they were actually uh, killing uh, Osama bin Laden. So, yeah, thanks for, thanks for reminding me and, and pointing that out, Sam. So... He, he's certainly um, he's certainly a, a prominent figure in the Obama administration, Tony. And you, you talked about him going on the Sunday shows recently, which I think is actually is interesting because yeah. he doesn't say a whole lot publicly. Um, and we know that he is fiercely loyal to President Obama. And I, I read a little bit about him uh, just to prepare for the show. Those that he has worked for, like President Obama, certainly have nothing but, but good to say about him because of his loyalty and, and his dedication. Uh, so I guess it depends on how much you like President Obama or uh, Tom Daschle, whoever it may be that, that McDonough has worked for, because, um, because he certainly doesn't put his career ahead of of, of whoever he's working for and, and whatever that politician's um, platform is. That's true. That's true. And uh, you know, I do think that uh, it probably should warrant some more conversation uh, next week because I couldn't get the, the video lined up for whatever reason. But I do think it's interesting um, to put the spotlight on because Syria especially is something that has fell into the, the sure. backdrop ever since the shutdown came about. And when Syria was first being discussed and, and President Obama was talking about why we needed to strike Syria, uh, for me, that was raising some red flags because I was like, here we are coming up to the debt ceiling debate. Here we are coming up to the implementation of Obamacare on October 1st. And then all of a sudden, we're being uh, told from the top down that we need to go to war with Syria. And they were making a big deal about it. And they were beating the drums harder than I've seen uh, beat since uh, the pre-Iraq days, and it, it was all kind of coming back as a, as a flashback at that point. And then, and then nothing happened. You know, whether it was Vladimir Putin stepping in and preventing it, or whether it was the American people voicing to their congressional representatives that they were weary of war, they didn't want any more war. Whatever it is, it, it seems like now Syria is nothing but an afterthought. And it's, it's shocking because you know, President Obama was telling us how urgent it was that we needed to go to war with them. Don't you think, Sam? I do. And uh, the end result, Tony, of this U.S.-Russian uh, agreement on, on the Assad regime giving up chemical weapons is we basically said to him, hey, you can, you can be a murderous thug and you can kill your own people however you want. As long as you don't use chemical weapons, hand those over when you feel like it. And... Uh, and you'll stay in power. Yeah, and it's a it's a really weak message to the rest of the dictators <laughs> around the world, that region or elsewhere. And that's uh, we're coming to the end of the the time here, Sam. So we'll continue this conversation on Dennis McDonough and his ties to Minnesota uh, next week on the show. We'd like to thank everybody for for coming on. Thank you for watching. Remember that we broadcast live every Saturday at SCC Television Studios in White Bear Lake. Our YouTube channel is Tony Hernandez Show. Go on YouTube, check us out, share it with your friends on Facebook and Twitter. And uh, we'd like to say, may God bless you, may God bless America, and vaya con Dios. <laughs>